Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar on, on environmental justice and the abandoned uranium mining crisis. I am Tim Judson, the Executive Director of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, which is hosting the presentation today. We are pleased that so many of you could be here. Uh, this month, NEARS is kicking off a new project to highlight the true environmental cost of nuclear power, called Nuclear is Dirty. This project will highlight the environmental, social justice, and public health impacts of nuclear power, from uranium mining through to the production and management of radioactive waste generated by nuclear power plants, and of course, nuclear power plant accidents. We are undertaking the Nuclear is Dirty project now, both in recognition of the fifth anniversary of the ongoing Fukushima Daiichi catastrophe, and to inform debates happening around the country about what our best energy options are for reducing carbon emissions and, for, and responding to climate change. Disturbingly, industry-friendly policymakers are promoting measures that would categorize nuclear power as a clean or even renewable energy resource, alongside solar, wind, geothermal, energy efficiency, and other renewables. The public and policymakers alike need to know the facts about nuclear power when weighing our energy options. In recent years, it has become clear that nuclear power is too expensive and too slow to be a long-term solution to the climate crisis. But given the enormity of the, t of the danger climate change poses, and the moral imperative to reduce carbon emissions and mitigate the harm to people, communities, and ecosystems, cost alone can, can't be our only consideration. The environmental and human costs of our energy choices are what matter most, and by that measure, nuclear also fails. The consequences of using uranium to power our communities are real and extensive. The Nuclear is Dirty project is going to lay it all out, starting with a 12-week series of events walking you through the entire nuclear fuel chain. We ask that you pay it forward and share the information with your friends. And not to worry, almost all of the events will be recorded like this one is being today, so you can share them by email, Facebook, and Twitter. We began the Nuclear Sturdy Project last week with a briefing on the Church Rock uranium mill tilling spill in 1979, the largest single release of radioactive material in U.S. history. The Church Rock disaster resulted in massive environmental contamination of the predominantly Navajo communities downstream along the Puerco River making it a tragedy of environmental racism as well. In that way, church rock is typical of the larger problems of uranium extraction, both in the U.S. and around the world. Uranium mining produces vast amounts of radioactive waste, and the industry typically targets indigenous and poor rural communities of color for uranium mining and milling. Today's presentation is about the quote-unquote normal practices with uranium mining and the, and the enormous problems of environmental justice that nuclear power is quite literally predicated upon. The crisis of, of abandoned uranium mines plaguing mostly indigenous communities in North America. We are honored to be joined by three activists leading the fight to stop uranium mining and get abandoned mines cleaned up. Klee Benali of the Diné, of Diné Nation, coordinator of the Clean Up the Mines campaign. Charmaine Whiteface of, of Lakota, coordinator of Defenders of the Black Hills. And Albert of the Acoma Pueblo. Um, and a, a member of the Laguna and Nakoma Coalition for a Safe Environment and a board member of the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment. In a moment, we will move on to the presentation, but first I have a few instructions on how we're going to handle questions and answers because we do want to have a robust discussion on the presentation. Uh, because of the large number of participants today, everybody has been muted, um, and so we're going to take questions and answers at the end of the presentation. And if you look at the, um, the control panel that should be on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, you'll find uh, a window that has a hand symbol, uh, which you can, use, you can press that uh, with your mouse uh, to raise your hand. And then when we get to the question and answers, uh, we'll begin going through everyone uh, in order. Uh, and so we'll unmute you so you can ask your question. Uh, if you also prefer to, uh, to type your question, you can do that in the chat window that's also on the right-hand side of your screen. And we'll go through. Uh, alternating between verbal and, and, and written questions. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to turn it over to our, to our presenters, and, um, and we'll begin uh, with, uh, with Klee Benali from the Clean Up the Minds campaign. Uh, Klee, I'm just going to hand over the presentation to you right now. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, can you see me? Is everything working out okay? Uh, looks like it. Uh, it might just take it. There you go. There's your screen. All right. Well, yate bene yate che kli dasha jene turchi ni shubasha chi na ro nakadena dasha nala shuma e be eitha chi ado be eitha chi dasha che. My name is Kli Benali, originally from Black Mesa on the Dene Nation here in the Four Corners area. Currently, I reside in Flagstaff, where 
I'm joining you in the webinar from today. I am the National Coordinator for Clean Up the Mines effort, which is an effort that was called forward by Charmaine Whiteface uh, with Defenders of the Black Hills, who will be presenting on some of the issues they're facing there in South Dakota, uh, specifically to pass legislation through Congress uh, to ensure the cleanup of the more than 15,000 abandoned uranium mines located throughout the United States. And this is on public, private, and uh, tribal lands as well. Uh, so my part of the presentation today will focus uh, a bit on the sort of overall information uh, regarding abandoned uranium mines, and then some specifics about the, the, the bill that we're proposing and also what you can do. So um, I'll dig right in. And I, I, I see on the attendees we have some really great resources uh, and uh, amazing advocates and activists who, who have for uh, many years been addressing this issue. So hopefully we can dig uh, deep today and really give you um, some, some evidence of why nuclear is dirty. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, if I can, can you can you see my screen? Oh, yeah, we can. Okay, excellent. Oh, no, now I need to go go back. Uh, all right. If my and this isn't cooperating now. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, From the top, what would a webinar be without technical difficulties? Um, so there are more than 15,000 abandoned uranium mines located in the U.S. Um, the true location, uh, existing hazard, and off-site migration potential for uh, these um, sites has never been fully determined. Um, and so this is something that we're trying to address through our uh, our bill. Um, we've, we recognize that the USGS has an inventory, Department of en uh, Energy has an inventory, um, but there are sort of inconsistencies or discrepancy in relation to the number um, and the location. Uh, for example, the Navajo Nation has a five-year cleanup plan to address uh, abandoned uranium mines. They've identified 523, but there are still some that are being located and, and identified. So that number is changing. The, uh, what is, excuse me, this is, uh, my presentation is not cooperating. I hope I'm not get, giving anybody motion sickness. <laughs> um, This is an image that just shows the sources for uranium uh, that has been mined for bombs in number of tons. And I'm, I'm just going to skip through um, a, a bit of this, but I, it, it's important to provide context because a majority of the uh, amount of material that was mined uh, for, for uranium in this country has been used for weapons. Um, we estimate that there's about 10 million people that uh, live within 50 miles of a recorded uh, abandoned uranium mine. Um, and this, this number, you know, I, I just wanted to sort of highlight, it, it seems a bit arbitrary. Um, this is based upon uh, the EPA um, data, but uh, it's important to note that in, in some cases the EPA identifies that, you know, one mile is the dangerous sort of exposure um, uh, uh, proximity. Um, or, or, you know, up, up in, in, in past one mile, then the, the threat uh, is a little bit less. But I, I want to, as I go through the presentation, I want you to think about that in relation to 50 miles and what that, um, what that means. 75% um, of AUMs, uh, the abandoned uranium mines, are located on federal and tribal lands. Uh, there are about 3,272 uh, prospects and abandoned uranium mines located in five states, and there's uh, 15 western states that have high concentrations of abandoned uranium mines. Um, and Charmaine will be talking about this a bit later, but there are 169 abandoned uranium mines located 40 miles within uh, Mount Rushmore 
on the Black Hills. Uh, there are 272 abandoned uranium mines in South Dakota, uh, and only one of them has been identified for cleanup under current existing laws. Um, and this is, you know, just to highlight a couple of national monuments and threats that majority of the American public is completely unaware of, that there are five wells and 15 springs in the Grand Canyon area that uh, contain exceeding levels uh, of EPA exceeding levels of uranium from multiple abandoned uranium mines. And there are new mines uh, that are threatening the Grand Canyon uh, area uh, to this day, including the Canyon Mine, which is about five miles uh, south of the south rim of the Grand Canyon, adjacent to Red Butte, which is a sacred site for Havasupai. And that mine is it has been under construction, but there are uh, issues with the air quality permit, so that, that mining operation is put on hold right now. Um, so the purpose of our work is to address the fact that there, with Clean Up the Mines, is to address the fact that there are no existing federal laws that require cleanup of these hazardous sites. Uh, unlike, and this is according to the EPA, unlike the uh, uranium mill tailings cleanup program, there's no specific legislation to address abandoned uranium mines. Most of these abandoned uranium mines were established under the general mining law of 1872 that does not require reclamation or remediation. So essentially, corporations walk away while the public pays. Um, you know, there, there are many of them have gone bankrupt and have left uh, the public, our communities, to bear their toxic legacies. And the cost for cleanups of these abandoned sites has really been um, placed upon taxpayers. Um, where there are some laws that apply uh, CERCLA for uh, one example, which uh, is a super fund that has no 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 money right now for cleanup and uh, CERCLA is really um, deficient in that uh, their uh, national priorities list uh, is established around population density uh, but many of our communities especially indigenous communities are very rural and we don't have the dense high you know high population numbers in dense areas uh, we're very spread out and uh, so our communities are very uh, much impacted by hazardous site abandoned uranium mines, but we're, we're not eligible for the national priorities list. And so there's a, a deficit within CERCLA that uh, leaves our communities still at great risk. Um, so abandoned uranium mines remain dangerously active for hundreds uh, of thousands of years. Uh, this is important to note in relation to 99% of or, or more of rock extracted from a mine can end up uh, in the remaining pulverized rock debris. Uh, that waste retains 85% of the radioactivity of the original underground. Uh, quantities of ura radium and radon gas, which are potent human carcinogens uh, given off by abandoned uranium mines will diminish by only one half in 80,000 years. Um, this is a sign, this, this is actually a location in South Dakota, Riley Pass, um, which I believe Charmaine will be talking more about as well. Um, but this is just to highlight that this is the only protection, uh, this sign is the only protection. There's no fences in this area, um, and there are ranches and sacred sites, uh, such as the Cave Hills, which here um, in uh, Riley Pass in South Dakota, um, this is a sacred site that is desecrated by abandoned ur uranium mine. Um, and this is, a, this is a super fun site. And again, I believe Charmaine will be talking about this more. Um, but long-term public use of areas um, such as recreation, ranching, and of course, um, our practices relating to sacred places means greater exposure to radioactive waste. Um, this is important to recognize. Um, abandoned uranium mine waste has also been used for housing construction, uh, creating sig significant radon and radiation hazards for our communities. And uh, you know that's been part of the, the focus of the Navajo Nation five-year plan is to address those priority issues. And I will talk a little bit more about the issues with the five-year plan um, as well. Um, abandoned uranium mines pose an invis invisible threat. And this is because uh, 
you cannot smell or taste radioactive dust. It looks like regular dust. Without pri proper scientific instruments such as Geiger counters, um, there's no way really of telling what areas are contaminated. And this picture um, in the background is a picture of a, radio, uh, a Geiger counter in a playground in uh, South Dakota, Ludlow, South Dakota, where we took a, a very, um, very serious reading. There is no safe dose of radiation um, that's considered to be harmless. And this is, um, you know, gets us into the impacts that we face in our communities. Um, radioactivity from abandoned uranium mines can cause cancer and other organ damage, especially during fetal development and young children. Right now in the Navajo Nation, there's never been a comprehensive a uh, health study addressing the, the impacts to our communities. There's been studies looking at the, um, uh, the impacts to minors, uh, and, and many of my, my relatives are minors, and they today um, in, 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 in uranium mines and mills, and they suffer the health impacts to this day. Um, but uh, currently we have the Navajo birth cohort studies that's looking at um, issues around the um, the, the Navajo Nation um, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Johnny Lewis who's the lead um, uh, for the DNA project in the Navajo birth cohort studies and they found that um, that the highest percentage of tribal populations localized uh, to 13 western states face uh, more than 4,000 abandoned uranium mines and only 15% of water sources have been sampled for contamination. And they've also found that tribal communities have 50% higher prevalence for eight track birth defects. Um, and, and they've stated that this is the first time they've had this picture. Um, the Navajo birth cohort studies working with uh, 15, about 1,500 families and looking uh, at uh, about 50% of the Navajo Nation has anti-nucular antibodies. Um, versus 13% nationally, and uh, anti-nuclear antibodies are linked with autoimmune diseases. Um, so the Navajo birth cohort study is seriously looking at the relation between uranium and ANA. Um, there's also look at, at arsenic and how arsenic and uranium together increase DNA damage. Um, so these are important studies that are being done by independent groups. Um, and not by the federal government at this point. Um, very little has been done, and as I mentioned before, there's never been a comprehensive uh, study on the human health impacts that the legacy of uranium mining has had in our communities, specific around the Navajo Nation. This also means that other indigenous communities also face the same deficit. Um, and uh, as I highlighted the picture earlier with the Geiger counter that um, the reading was taken at Ludlow School, in the background to the right of this school, uh, about 200 meters away, is an is uh, abandoned uranium on, on private land. Um, and uh, we took readings that were four times uh, the allowable safe return limits for people in evacuation areas, um, the Fukushima uh, Daiichi uh, plant disaster. Um, I, I won't go too much into details, but, you know, we have contaminated wa uh, water supplies due to abandoned uranium mines. Um, the Colorado River, which feeds 27 million people, um, is threatened because of uh, its proximity to abandoned uranium mines, but also uh, mills that um, are, are being addressed for cleanup to some degree. Um, Dust uh, is a, a significant issue in relation to uh, exposure as well. Um, so uh, particles and dust can travel for hundreds of miles. So when we talk about proximity to abandoned uranium mines, um, certainly chronic long-term exposure to these sites puts people at greater risk. Um, but you know, if you you're at risk if you're drinking water um, from these areas and breathing dust. Um, so alpha and beta radiation particles emitted from uh, these uh, contaminants can cause severe damage to cells if they're released from within the body, which can happen after a person drinks the water or inhale, inhales dust that's contaminated. Um, and it, it, of course, can increase risk of lung cancer. Um, 
and this this you know the migration potential for contaminants from abandoned uranium mines is really severe. We're looking at areas in um, South Dakota along the Cheyenne River which have no abandoned uranium mines in the direct proximity, but upstream uh, near the headwaters uh, in Wyoming, in a completely other state, uh, contaminants have migrated uh, down and contaminated the Cheyenne River and really created a situation where residents consider that river to be a dead river. And I, again, I believe Charmaine uh, from Defenders of Black Hills will be talking more about that. Um, this is a picture of an abandoned uranium mine in Cameron on the Navajo Nation. Uh, there is a five-year plan, which is actually extended beyond five years and um, has really been doubled uh, and will most likely be extended out right now uh, on the Navajo Nation, which initially um, was proposed by uh, Congressperson Henry Waxman uh, to address the severe uh, issues of uh, the toxic abandoned uranium mines in the Navajo Nation. As I mentioned before, we have over 523 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation, and currently the, the five-year plan has identified 43 uh, priority sites for cleanup. In the area of Cameron, there's 19 priority sites, um, but very, and, and this is very inconsistent in relation to what we're talking about when we talk about cleanup here, and this is uh, part of the, the necessity of, of the bill that we're proposing. Um, and so in some of these sites, and including this site that the, this picture we're looking at right now, um, we identify this basically as toxic landscaping, where um, in some cases the, uh, the radioactive material, is it, the waste is just being moved around um, or being covered up uh, by, um, by rock uh, in, in, in other um, uh, uh, coverage and so this site specifically um, there's a pit that was dug uh, with no lining to protect the groundwater uh, the radioactive material was put and the waste was put in uh, that pit uh, and then covered up uh, and there's you know just fencing and signs to protect the community but in this area I was there just um, a few weeks ago um, there were signs of um, drainage coming down from this pit, and there's very close proximity. I mean, we have like, you know, within hundreds of feet uh, residents living uh, in this site, and so, you know, this this isn't cleanup. Uh, we don't have a consistent standard for cleanup. Um, uh, right now, as we mentioned, there's no laws that require cleanup, but there's also um, uh, and many of these sites have been abandoned for 60 years, uh, but there's also no consistent standard. Uh, for cleanup, and so that's what uh, our bill is looking to do. So our, our bill is called the Abandoned Uranium Mines Remediation Act. Um, uh, Congressman Raul Guajalva, Democrat from Tucson, has agreed to introduce the bill. It has not been introduced yet, so we do not have a bill number. Um, hey, I can interrupt yeah. for just a second. It looks like your, your slides have shut down for the last couple of minutes. Um, oh. um, uh. We're we're seeing a screen that just uh, has a co has uh, there you go okay perfect okay what what did it have on it uh, well it just showed uh, your, your your two different Prezi files that you have queued up but uh, but oh, okay actual slides okay sorry about that um, this is this is the picture that I was showing you might have missed that but this is the picture of the abandoned uranium site that was quote unquote cleaned up in Cameron. This is the um, this is an, a bit of an overview, just a brief of uh, some of the elements of the Abandoned Uranium Mines Remediation Act. Uh, it would establish a complete inventory of all existing abandoned uranium um, mines and exploratory sites. Um, and this, of course, we'd be working with different agencies uh, uh, as instructed under this bill to ensure that you know there, there's. Um, whatever existing inventories um, are out there are um, taken into account and so forth. Um, it also authorized the EPA to develop uh, action plans for site-specific reclamation of abandoned uranium mines and exploratory sites. Um, and it would call for temporary closure or immediate remediation of operating mines within the same watershed. And also institute a program of public education on dangers of abandoned uranium mines. Uh, it would also mandate accountability, enforcement, and public oversight to ensure cleanup of abandoned uranium mines. 
and I'd be happy to uh, take questions about specifics uh, if anybody has any uh, questions about uh, the bill itself as well. Um, but you can join our campaign in support uh, by contacting Congress and urging them to prioritize a cleanup of the more than 15,000 abandoned uranium mines that plague our communities. Um, we have petitions online on our website, which is cleanupthemines.org. You can help us spread the word through social media and get connected through our website as well. Um, and uh, if you're part of an organization joining us on the webinar today, you can uh, endorse our campaign if you haven't already. Um, we have a range of resources as well that uh, you, you could help us with organizing a presentation in your community um, and share your story as well. So um, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for having me on this call. Um, and I uh, greatly appreciate um, uh, the opportunity to present. I know that there's a lot of information, not a lot of time uh, uh, to, to present it in. Um, but again, I really appreciate the opportunity to present uh, for you and I taking uh, some of your questions. Great. Thanks so much, Clee. I think we're going to um, hold questions until after the other presentations are done. Um, but uh, so, yeah, if, 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 if you can stick around until after um, Charmaine's and Petucci's. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, terrific. Okay, so I think next uh, we'll hand it over to Charmaine Whiteface of Defenders of the Black Hills. And I'm just going to uh, switch over the controls of the presentation. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Charmaine. Thanks so much. OK, good, good. Um, what, I, what I have asked him to show is a little nine-minute video um, that ha really we crunched a lot of information into that nine-minute video, but at least you can see the area that we're talking about. We are about a thousand miles north of from where Clee, Benelli, and Patooch Gilbert are located. And just like Clee said, nobody knew about us that we were up here. I'm the coordinator for Defenders of the Black Hills. We are uh, an environmental organization. We say without racial or tribal boundaries. We have members from all over the world, really, and we only we're all volunteers, and we work on on a lot of issues. This one about the uranium, this one is my issue. I am a, a physical scientist and a biologist, but I'm also a, a Ogallala Tituan Ocheti Shakoi. So, Tim, if you want to start the the film, sure, this, uh, thank you. This uh, film is on our website. It's uh, uranium mining uh, on the northern Great Plains. Um, I think I, I think I messed up the audio. <laughs> um, Chichuan name is a little wise one who makes a My name is Charmaine Whiteson. I spoke in my language and I said, my uh, Tituan name is a little wise one who makes a mark. And I am from the Ogallala band of the nation who speaks the Hello, Tim. I can't hear anything. Sorry, everyone. It's come to my attention that uh, that the audio isn't working properly, so I'm just going to make that adjustment real quick.
My name is Charmaine Whiteface. Zumi lava baga e machi apie. O lala titoa o chetishakor. I spoke in my language and I said, my uh, Titua name is a little wise one who makes a mark. And I am from the Oglala band of the nation who speaks the sub, the sub nation who speaks the dialect of the Lakota language of the Great Sioux Nation. We resided in many places in the United States, but our last homeland has been the Northern Great Plains. The Northern Great Plains is made up of the states of Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming, and South Dakota. This area also was the last area uh, of a treaty we made with the United States in 1868 called the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. And you can see North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, and parts of Nebraska. In uh, 1851, we also had the prior treaty, before 68, we also had Colorado, uh, parts of Kansas in, in our treaty territory. And so many people call this whole area here uh, Lakota territory. Lilius, Dr. Lilius Jarding, in her research that she completed in 2010, called Uranium Activities Impacts on Lakota Territory, talked about not only uh, what was happening in the Northern Great Plains, but also in Colorado. All of these are abandoned open pit uranium mines. Uh, 397 in Montana, 2,103 in Wyoming, 113 in North Dakota, 272 in South Dakota, 387 in Northern Colorado, uh, for a total of 3,272. This is an abandoned open pit uranium mine on the southwestern edge of the Black Hills. Here you see it again. And back here you can see the Black Hills. This is called the Darrow Pitts Mine. If you put it all together in one, one box, it would be about a mile square. The thing about the Darrow Pitts Mine is that they are only 40 miles from Mount Rushmore. Millions of tourists travel to Mount Rushmore every year, not knowing that they are breathing in radioactive dust and the water that they drink in the motels in Rapid City contains uranium. Here is another map uh, given us to us by Custer National Forest out of Billings, Montana. This is the Black Hills. We were right here uh, at the Darrow Pitts Mine. Mount Rushmore is right over here. And now we're going to head up to the northwestern corner of South Dakota and look at some more abandoned uranium mines. This mine, the, this, if we could go behind this wall, it's called the Riley Pass Mine. And th we're standing facing the Riley Pass Mine, which is behind here. But I wanted to show you this because all of this is radioactive overburden. It was pushed off. This whole rim rock was about this high, but they pushed it off as they were trying to dig out the uranium. And a lot of radioactive material went off in the overburden. But what they didn't consider was that this was also a sacred site. There were burial sites there. There were sacred sites there. There were spirit writings on all of these petroglyphs. A warning sign at the Rally Pass Mine says, warning, caution, radiation area. Radiation levels in this area are elevated. No more than one day within a one-year period should be spent in this area. No camping. Recently, March 2013, the U.S. Forest Service finally issued a public safety closure order because of the dangers to human health. Among the particles that are in there are arsenic, molybdenum, thorium, radium, and uranium. These are all in the form uh, of dust or runoff, and they're picked up by the wind. So when we are in there, when we're standing over by that sacred site praying, we're breathing in a lot of these harmful uh, materials. But the wind doesn't just stop at the end of South Dakota. These harmful materials are traveling all over the country. 
why it's important to the Great Sioux Nation and why we are trying to get people informed of this, research was done on the cancer mortality rates of all, of all the uh, Native people by the Indian Health Service. And these are all the different regions. But for us, it is the Northern Great Plains region. This is us. This is all U.S. races, not just Native, all U.S. races. And what this study shows is that those of us in the Northern Great Plains, Native Americans in the Northern Great Plains, have the highest cancer rates in the country. This is the 1868 Treaty Territory. I showed you this before. All of those abandoned uranium mines, the Riley Pass mine where we were at, is right here. More in North Dakota, Montana, all of those in Wyoming, here in uh, southwestern South Dakota, just miles from Mount Rushmore. Down here is uh, Colorado, those ones down in northern, northern Colorado. The 1868 Treaty Territory, because of all these abandoned open pit uranium mines, we were calling it America's Chernobyl in reference to the Chernobyl nuclear disaster that happened in 1986, 25 years ago in Russia. Our levels were very, very high compared to Chernobyl until Dr. Kirfut with her students came out and start doing some readings in our treaty territory. And this is what they found. The radiation levels in parts I visited with my students were higher than those in the evacuate zone around the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Higher. Fukushima radiation levels were higher than Chernobyl. The Northern Great Plains levels are higher than Fukushima. And these are not from nuclear power plants or from an atomic weapon or atomic bomb being exploded. These are from 2,885 abandoned open pit uranium mines and prospects. And we are subject to that radioactive pollution constantly. We, people of the Great Sioux Nation, we are the miners' canary. We are the miners' canary for the rest of the United States. We have the highest cancer rates now. We never gave permission for uranium mining to occur in our treaty territory. The people say, no uranium mining in Great Sioux Nation territory. We know what this means. What can you do? Spread the word. Let the people know all over the United States. Let the people know. It's not just the nuclear power plants that people have to be afraid of. All of these abandoned open pit uranium mines in the northern Great Plains are, are affecting everyone. But they are genocide for the Great Sioux Nation, for my people. This is genocide. Contact your congressmen, your senators. Ask them to pass a bill to clean up all the abandoned uranium mines in all of the United States, to clean up all the abandoned uranium mines and prospects with no new mining, no new uranium mining, until all of these abandoned mines are cleaned up. More information can be obtained at www.defendblackhills.org. I'm Charmaine Whiteface, coordinator for Defenders of the Black Hills. If you do this, you will stop the genocide of my people. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charmaine, for sharing that really powerful video. I, I think you said you wanted to follow up, follow that up with a few comments about uh, about about what, what's continuing to go on. Um, we that that video was made in 2013, but we have been trying for years to to have this situation addressed. We wrote, we had form letters, hundreds of form letters sent to President Obama petitions sent to President Obama, uh, petitions and letters sent to Michelle Obama. And, and then we finally started. Um, I, I went on a, a, a peace walk with the, on the Buddhist peace walk in Massachusetts 
and that's when we first started talking about a bill needs to be passed. And so that's where I met more and more people to help get this bill passed, and and um, so that's where we are at now. The uranium mines and prospects. If you look at this picture here, those purple lines, those are the rivers. And, and what it doesn't show on here is the Missouri River. All of these purple lines up there at the top where it says 103 mines at the very top starting, it's right at the corner. Right there, that's where the North Cave Hills is. That's where the Riley Pass mine is. Those, that river, which is polluted, uh, was the drinking water for three villages along there, and then it empties into the Missouri River. The purple line right below it, again, those are, that's the Morro River, and that goes also, carries radioactive pollution into the Morro River. Um, if you look further down, you'll see the, the Black Hills, you'll see uh, 667 mines in Wyoming, and you'll see all these fingers coming out. The top river is the Balfouche River, the bottom one is the Cheyenne River, and it says 169 mines right there down at that bottom corner. Those the Cheyenne River continues on, and then it empties into the Missouri River. All the, I have water tested all the rivers, in, except for the Bad River, but I, I've learned since then that that also is contaminated with uranium uh, radioactive pollution. But all the rivers in western South Dakota are contaminated with radioactive pollution, and it's emptying into the Missouri River. We have taken a... Uh, sample way down at the southeastern end of South Dakota, and it's you have uranium in the water down there too. Um, <clears throat> the little picture in the in the corner this shows the Great Sioux the Great Sioux Reservation, which is all of western South Dakota, according to the 1868 treaty. And this is the big, huge area. All the hash marks; those are Wyoming, uh, Montana, North Dakota, and Nebraska. And our little organization, Defenders of the Black Hills, we work at the environment, con concerning the environment of all of this, the Great Sioux Reservation, plus all of this area. And that's why we're concerned about all of these abandoned uranium mines in our area. It was in South Dakota that we asked for the CDC to come, and they said they would not come to do some measurements, to do some studies because we do not have one million people in South Dakota. The whole state, there's not one million people. So the CDC would not come to do any kind of tests or studies about this issue. We do not have the big academic institutions that would normally someplace be doing the studies. We would invite any academics that want to come and ask us what needs to be studied or there's so much that needs to be taken into consideration. The health studies need to be done. Um, my little studies are, are just to get a base, a baseline of how far out did this radioactive pollution go in the water, particularly in the water. And so um, that was when we, you know, we, we are pushing for this um, this abandoned uranium mine remediation act. We have other videos about this on the, on our website, uh, www.defendblackhills.org. Um, so that's what I would ask people. If you want to know more, go to our website. We've been trying to bring this to the public's attention probably since 2003. Um, and I really appreciate you, Tim, for doing this and NEARS, we hand out your information that says no dose is safe. We hand that out. We've been handing that out for years, trying to teach people about this issue. Um, Montana, Wyoming, and Wyoming, especially in South Dakota, are both pro-uranium mining states. So we know we know we cannot get any congressional help from up here, and that's why we wanted to join up with the. Uh, uh, Navajo people, Pueblo people, all the people in the Southwest where they do have a higher population and do have maybe Congress people who will be more open to listening to what is happening. But three million visitors, three million tourists come to Mount Rushmore every year and they don't know they're breathing in that radioactive dust. All of our water that we, all the water every place out here 
whether it comes from an aquifer or comes from a river, is contaminated with uranium. So I just want to say thank you, Tim, and thank you to NIRS for, for doing this. And I will be glad to stay on the line to answer any other questions. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Charmaine, for sharing all of this. It's really just, I think, incredibly eye-opening um, to people who mostly focus on issues of nuclear power plants and, and whatnot. Um, and even, I think, the general public you know, has a, have, may have a sense that radiation isn't safe, but everyone uh, seems to think that it, the, you know, the radiation is contained and only gets released you know, during a major accident like Fukushima. I think to get a sense of, um, of you know, what's really happening in communities facing this kind of contamination um, you know, will be, is, is incredibly important. So we're, 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 we're really just so honored to have you and to help get the word out. Thank you. So I think um, with that, we want to uh, kind of come back to the Southwest um, and hear oh. from um, Patuch Gilbert um, from the Yakima Pueblo um, and the Laguna and Yakima Coalition for a Safe Environment. Uh, Patuch, are you still with us? Hello, Tim. Hi, Patuch. Yeah, OK. Uh, make sure my mute is back off. And uh, thank you for Clee and uh, Charmaine. Um, and I live here at in New Mexico, in I suppose a very radioactive. I call it a really irradiated state. Uh, meaning all of New Mexico because of its dependency on nuclear energy. Uh, it's a good thing we don't have any nuclear power reactors, but we have these huge radioactive emitting locations, not only from the abandoned uranium mines, old mill sites, but uh, uh, White Sands, the birthplace of the atomic bomb. Your two NASA laboratories, the waste isolation pilot plant in Carlsbad, a uranium enrichment facility in Yunus, and even their, some of the population desire to build a high level nuclear storage facility. So we're so predominantly reliant on this whole nuclear fuel chain that uh, it's ungastly. And, uh, you know, nuclear is, is dirty, yes but it's also very, very dangerous. And I think it's something that the public doesn't want to realize that uh, I learned in Japan, I was in Japan for the Hiroshima uh, uh, Nuclear Radiation Victims Forum, and that essentially all people, all people globally, are becoming nuclear radiation victims because of this reliance of the, on the use of nuclear energy in all of its forms. Everything along this nuclear fuel chain path is extremely dangerous. And I hope that Charmaine explains that because uranium is laced with uh, coal, and I didn't know that every time coal is burned in in new uh, uh, coal-fired power generation plants, that that radioactive dust is spewed out, and people are just breathing it all over. So that's why you know I I believe that it's really occurring all over the world, and that there is this uh, environment that just is happening to all people. So just based on that, I wanted to just talk more about where I live in here in, in New Mexico. If you can picture New Mexico as the state, it's intersected by Interstate I-40, uh, east-west, and Interstate uh, I-25 that goes north-south. So we live, I live in the northwest quadrant of New Mexico. 
and this this is where the Grants Mining District uh, is is named mainly because I because of uranium mining. Sometimes people refer it to, as to the Grants Uranium Mining District, but I use the terminology that EPA uses, Grants Mining District. And it is approximately uh, 25 miles wide and 100 miles long. Albuquerque is more or less in the center of the state. And uh, so it's, if you keep going westward, uh, you reach uh, Laguna Pueblo and the My Pueblo, Acoma, and then to the west is the Navajo Nation. And this is where, again, uh, west of the Rio Perco is the Grants Mining District. And you saw this heyday of uranium mining activity that really began uh, after, after the atomic bomb was tested and uh, this mining and milling went on into the 1990s. Essentially, it was, it was 50 years. And uh, at one time, uh, I mean, there was so much mining going on in this Grants Mining District that uh, this small community called Grants called itself the uranium capital of the world. Can you imagine that? And uh, it did away with the name some uh, some time back after the bust of the uranium market. Uh, but uh, that's where the center of all of this uh, uh, uranium boom occurred. And in this whole Grant Sear mining district, uh, you know, we talk about the numbers of abandoned uranium mines. It's always, uh, I suppose, ca contested or challenged as to what is an abandoned uranium mine. But EPA documents that there are seven, 97, 97 AUMs and five uranium mills that were used to process the ore. But I just believe that there's many more uh, that aren't really identified as abandoned uranium mines simply because there was so much uh, prospect in and everybody wanted to make money. And even what I term mom and pop uh, uranium uh, holes in the ground that uh, people were were mining ore and taking it to a place where they did uh, collect ore and they sampled it and if they found enough uranium uh, in it, then they would uh, pay these people for for these uh, ores that they have brought in. But the major mining companies that were here were uh, the famous ones that are transnational and multinational corporations like uh, Anaconda. Uh, the home stake, uh, now called the home stake Barrett Gold uh, Transnational Corporation. The uh, Gulf Chevron operated a mine. Um, and United Nuclear Corporation were, were was also, of course, here. And, and there were others, you know, of smaller. But there are, it's very well documented in terms of uh, the the development of mining and, and milling in this area here. I was asking some people yesterday, how many Superfund sites are there? Uh, remember that program, that the circle program that Clee uh, referred to? Uh, there were five, five uh, either former uh, Superfund sites or ongoing Superfund uh, sites that are being attended to by uh, under EPA. Once when a Superfund site has been, I suppose, remediated, then that's turned over to the Department of Energy. One of the old Anaconda mill sites is in the situation here. Uh, the one that's really uh, contaminated and affecting the lives of people is the one that is called the Homestake Barrett Go site. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But uh, the probably there are over 480, but that's what the numbers that more or less that, that are being it's been used to, to document how many abandoned uranium sites in in New Mexico. And as has mentioned, over 500 on the Navajo uh, reservation, and but probably a whole lot a whole lot more. And of course, all of these 
sites, you know, contaminate the groundwater. Uh, there was considerable amount of underground mining that occurred, and uh, and every time the uranium is mobilized underground, then that really sp spreads around the radioactive contamination in groundwater. Then when it's brought up to the surface, uh, you see all of this radioactive waste, then it's spread out all over the place, and then uh, those are left on the ground, and really through winds, and it's just spewing radioactive dust all over the place, or when it rains or snows and the water uh, runs off the land, then you see this contamination surface-wise and just uh, collecting ponds that are probably radioactive, that wildlife uh, drink from, hikers or uh, other people that are in the area don't know that it's, it's really radioactive uh, poisonous. And I remember one time I and a colleague were at a an abund, abandoned uranium site, and we were there with federal and state scientists. And one of them had an instrument reading, and uh, I asked this man, is it dangerous to stand here on this radioactive uh, ore waste? He said, well, if you stood here over a number of years, yeah, you would uh, uh, be affected. I said, but how about that uh, uh, hole we were at that there was an added in a, uh, a cavern on the ground, and he said, I won't even let you stand there because my instrument could not read it. It would just be too high. And yet these sites are not posted in any way as being dangerously radioactive. And so it always has been a challenge to get the state of New Mexico or the federal government to document not only where are these sites located, but to show that they are radioactively dangerous. And, and and so it, it affects everybody and everything. And it's just that uh, I think that there's not enough of a, a political climate to, to have these sites cleaned up or even in some way just to document and post that they are dangerous. Um, New Mexico is like, like South Dakota, all, all the Charmes, yes, there's more people there. It just does not warrant enough, I think, attention to, to really have uh, these sites cleaned up. And in fact, some of the people in grants, uh, this mining community where the mining took place, want new uranium mines. Uh, mainly the reasoning is it brings in jobs and revenues for the tax coffers and just they want, they're willing to to, to sacrifice themselves for their generation in order to make money. But I also believe that that occurs simply because you don't have enough information about the health impacts. Even though mining has occurred for over 50 years, the state and federal government still doesn't provide enough health risks information. And every time we go to the politicians and tell them we need health studies, the common uh, response is no monies, and if we did new mining, then we could uh, uh, put requirements in there for 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 health studies. So you know we get blackmail like that. You know every time we ask, we demand health studies, but generally we we certainly continue to emphasize the need for this uranium uh, radioactive uh, studies to be performed. And unfortunately, we don't have some of the Navajo people that live uh, at Church Rock within hundreds of feet of uh, abandoned uranium mines to tell about their situation there or some of the health effects that they're encountering. But when you process the uranium ore, then you have to, uh, when it's turned into yellow cake, you have to have a whole mill in order to do that. And these mills, in order to process uranium ore, require, uh, you know, uh, toxic chemicals to dissolve the rocks after it's been crushed. And so you, you have chemical uh, contamination as a result of hydro, you know, uh, sulfuric acids and other kinds of uh, contamination that are, that are liquid that help pulverize the rocks. And 
uh, so all of this is placed in this into mill tailings. So you see, have, you see have hundreds of acres around a mill site that is, have become radioactive waste sites. And the state has attempted over 30 years now to clean up the home estate Barago site in Milan, uh, which is right next to Grants. And it still can't be cleaned up. And I think the state and federal government are finding out that it's impossible to do so. And they know that they can never get back to the original background. But they're still spending millions of dollars to to try and clean up an abandoned. Uh, I mean, it's not abandoned because the government and the Department of Energy, EPA, the State of New Mexico Environment Department are still studying these uh, and in this old mill sites, mill tailing sites, and attempting to remediate them. But in the meantime, it's contaminating groundwater, surface water. It, it, spews out radon gas that affects people everywhere. And this community, it calls itself the Mora Acres community of the, of the Blue Water Valley Downstream Association, which lives, you know, just a couple hundred feet away from this homestead Barago site, are finding that, uh, they're, that they're dying from cancer. They had published a map in the Albuquerque Journal, you know, uh, they called it the death map, just uh, saying that of all the people that they had uh, that determined that had died as a result of, of uh, cancers by living so close to this Homestake Barago mill site. And even when uh, the EPA did an environmental risk assessment for this particular site, they themselves said that uh, these people that live in this area here face excess cancer risks 18 times higher than what EPA determines is generally acceptable risks for radioactive nuclei in outdoor air. And, and again, yet both the NRC and EPA, the state of New Mexico, just I suppose, don't want to really get to the bottom of the problem in either removing that site, of which they say it's going to cost too much and cause greater contamination, or doing something that will permanently resolve this, this, the situation. But in the meantime, the groundwater gets contaminated, which the cities of living next to that mill sites get affected. We as the uh, Akama people living downstream and our sister public to the east, Laguna, all get affected because we live downstream from, from these places. And of course, you know, also when you look at uranium activity here in the Grants Mine District, at one time, Laguna Pueblo, our sister Pueblo, had the world's largest open pit uranium mine in the world. And now they're having to try and reclaim it. And in the meantime, everything around that site is, is, is contaminated. And our organization, in the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment, uh, really came together to, to work on this, this problem and to uh, try and get the public at large, Indian and non-Indian, to, to deal with this environmental contamination. We had passed a nuclear free zone declaration to get, uh, get to get everybody involved to break free of this nuclear nuclear uh, radiation that's, that's affecting all of us. And that's why it's good that if we can spread around the publicity about the dangers of this radioactive poisoning as affecting all people and how, and how we can all need to work together that I think it's, it has to be a national solution, and probably even an international solution. And I'm glad that NIRS is uh, having these kinds of uh, uh, webinars to begin to educate us. And I know this; it came up at the uh, Conference of the Parties meetings to talk about uh, moving away from, from this dependency on the nuclear fuel energy cycle. So that's about where I, I'm at here in uh, Acoma, and uh, we can answer any questions that uh, that continue to crop up. Thanks, Tim, and everybody. 
Well, thank you, Patuch. And it looks like we do have some some uh, questions lined up in the queue. And I think you know, as we kind of give people an opportunity to start, uh, you know, uh, asking their questions. Um, and just as a reminder to everybody who's on the line, uh, if you go into uh, the panel on the right hand side of your screen, there should be a button uh, that has a hand on it that you can click to to put yourself in the queue. Uh, you can also go into the panel called questions and type in a question if you prefer to ask your question that way. Um, but I think, you know, as we're kind of gearing up for folks to get in line, um, I, I guess the question I'd, I'd put to um, to all three of you or, or whoever wants to answer it um, is, uh, you know, the, uh, the Clean Up the Minds uh, delegation was here in D.C. a couple months ago and had a, had a meeting with the EPA, and I guess I would, um, you know, sort of ask uh, what are some of the things that the EPA can do uh, or that you're asking EPA to do uh, in addition in, to supporting the, um, the you know, Representative Grijalva's legislation uh, to be able to deal with uh, and, and help out uh, with some of the problems that are affecting communities near these abandoned uranium mine sites. Does anyone want to take that question? Klee, are you still on the line? Answer it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, the, the, well, the first thing I, I think we have to address is the Gold King mine spill uh, and the legacy of negligence that the EPA has with abandoned uranium mines. And, you know, any one of these 15,000 abandoned uranium mines could be a Gold King mine spill. Um, it's, it's really frustrating in the sense that, one, the city of Silverton was resistant to Superfund designation because they were eligible. Um, uh, so there are certain dynamics that we need to address there. But uh, the EPA needs to be more responsible. Uh, they need to uh, be more attentive to concerns in the community. I think they've been doing a really great job uh, with the Navajo Nation five-year cleanup plan in relation to consultation. Does it go far enough? No. Uh, does it address comprehensively the issue? No. Um, but it is a step, uh, and the consultation process has been um, somewhat meaningful in relation to the tribes being able to step up and, and, and share that responsibility. But the lack of consistency is the issue here, especially in relation to, uh, or, or one of the main issues here, especially in relation to this scenario that we're looking at in South Dakota, where there is very little attention. Um, and it, it, this, this, this shouldn't, especially if we're looking at um, you know, sort of population density and some of the issues around CERCLA and the, the laws that would trigger a response from the EPA. Um, you know, there, there are community members who have been struggling for years and raising their voice and raising the alarm, sounding the alarm for years, and nothing is really being done. And so, um, you know, there, there's a lack of, of, of willingness um, on a political and, and, and social responsible level level uh, and, and that that is completely irresponsible and it's negligent so um, the EPA does need to step up uh, and that's you know there's there as, as I mentioned before there is a deficit in relation to the existing laws and so um, you know that needs to be addressed I'm, I'm not an expert in the EPA in relation to you know um, these issues and I've, I've been to several meetings of course over the years and I, I presume there's other folks on this call who can definitely uh, talk more about that I'm sure Charmaine um, would be able to as well but I, I think that they have obviously they um, have a, 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 a federal obligation to address this but right now you know they're doing the minimum um, that is required for them and it, 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 it we shouldn't be the ones doing the job for them I think there's a really great example uh, currently um, with the the issue ongoing with contamination in the Sanders community in Arizona um, with the contaminated water systems and, and uh, you know private researchers uh, doing the job like Tommy Rock or Chris Shuey, um, you know, Talani Lake Enterprises and uh, uh, um, Shrick out of uh, New Mexico really doing the job of the federal government and that shouldn't be the case. Great, thanks. So I think we'll start going to questions let, from the attendee. Oh, sorry. Uh, let, me, let me also, let me, can I also add to that? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, 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 the federal government, EPA, you know, they listen. But that's about it. It's, it's, uh, we talk, you know, they, they listen. But it's not, an, it's not a national emergency. 
I think uh, they don't want to spend the millions of dollars necessary to clean up the mess. Uh, and I believe some of, a lot of it is because the lack of the knowledge and the severity of this nuclear radiation poisoning that uh, they won't spend the time and the money and the energy on it. Actually, uh, can I, oh, sorry. Um, Tim, this is Charmaine. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to say was that um, EPA, what regulations they have now are not adequate. When uh, Clee talked about the water, there, the EPA only monitors and regulates so certain, like a handful of radioactive particles in the water or in the air. Uh, Patooch mentioned the radioactive particles in the air in the coal smoke and the coal dust. Up here where I am in South Dakota, we get radioactive pollution, not just from the abandoned uranium mines, that's one way, but we also get it from other ways too, from the coal dust and the coal smoke, there's a lot of coal mining up here. We also get it from the old ICBM nuclear missiles which they left in the ground. Some of them were, were, were powered by nuclear power and then when they imploded those missile sites, hundreds of them, they left the nuclear, little nuclear uh, power generators down in the ground and now those are decaying and starting to pollute the aquifers. But EPA only monitors a handful of radioactive particles in water and in the air. And so it's, it is a national problem for everybody. These are, these, these are things we found out after we did just the research here and found out, learned that EPA doesn't monitor all these things, let alone regulate any of them. And so then when they tell a municipal water department that, oh no, the water is safe for the people, it's not. EPA is not telling the truth. And so municipal water departments think they're all doing a great job when they're not because they're only monitoring certain, a few handfuls of radioactive particles, not all the radioactive particles that they need to be looking at. We, in our bill, we wrote it uh, with the EPA in mind as, as doing this because EPA, of all the federal agencies, has a mandate to watch for the people's health, and they're not doing it. If I could add one more thing, uh, Tim. Sure, thank you. Um, well, uh, actually, two things real quick. Um, under the fi Navajo Nation five-year plan, the EPA is not assessing groundwater, and they also don't require air monitoring at abandoned uranium mines. So, you know, it, it's not sufficient enough to address the scope of the issue. Um, the second co issue is under the, the Clean Power Plan, we're really concerned that there is an open door with incentives uh, for further nuclear power, which means, of course, if we, if, we, if you know, if, as part of your campaign that nuclear is dirty, you know, the, the EPA seems to be obscuring with their outreach the fact that their, you know, nuclear power relies on uh, uranium mining. You can't have power without the mining unless they're going to be reprocessing and, you know, decommissioning uh, uh, weapons and uh, in, in, in reprocessing that material. But, um, you know, there, there is an incentive if the industry is pushing for the so-called clean nuclear po power um, uh, for more uranium, and this is what we face. Uh, you know, we, we, you, can't, you can't call, and, and, and it's, I'm great, you know, we're all grateful, I think, for you all to call out, you know, the sort, sort of uh, propaganda around nuclear being so-called clean because it's anything but. It's, it's dirty and it's deadly. Thanks, Clee. And yes, I, I think it's been one of the really disappointing things to us about uh, the way that the EPA has rolled out the Clean Power Plan. Um, you know, to see that um, on the one hand, when they released the, the draft regulation two years ago, uh, you know, it had some incredibly problematic aspects to it. And one of them was, was its environmental assessment of nuclear, which completely ignored the issues of uranium mining and environmental justice, you know, effectively uh, ignored the issue of nuclear accidents and uh, and all of the environmental problems that result from all these things and we were we were pleased that the EPA formally took nuclear power out of the clean power plan uh, but then last fall sort of in an about face has started to promote 
uh, you know, the, the virtues of nuclear power in relation to states meeting their, you know, their emissions reductions goals and completely ignoring uh, the environmental impacts that, you know, that we pointed out to them in the process of, of, of enacting the rule. Um, so we, you know, we, we, in fact, we are hoping that, you know, that, that, this, that this campaign can help push back on EPA to, you know, so, so that they stop promoting nuclear power as, as a way for, for, for states to meet their emissions goals. Um, so why don't we start taking some questions from the audience. Uh, first up is uh, Sue Anderson. Uh, Sue, would you like to ask your question? Sue, you should be unmuted now. Are you still with us? So when we were at Welton, and I never felt well there, I didn't know that sitting under our pad there was uh, all this uranium contamination from one, two, three, four, five, six uranium mines. Yes. I, had, I knew there was something wrong with that place. And I knew I never felt well there, and it was... You weren't there most of the time. You were with your father. It was dead. It was contaminated. It was sick. It was polluted. It was, it was a hellhole, and I knew something was wrong with me. And sure enough. Sure enough. And all of these... All of these you know where this was? Sue, can you, can you say again where, uh, what, what, what location you're talking about? Uh, does do any of the panelists have, to have a response to that? Sure. And I'm wondering if the other other place where we were, we always tracked around in that dust, and moved the water there. All the water is pretty rotted away. And I wonder why everybody the system. I knew there was something wrong with the and that was that was wrong. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, any of the panelists, do you have a response to, to Sue's comment? Let me go ahead and okay. respond. Uh, let me go ahead and respond just a little bit about uh, affected communities that live next to abandoned uranium mines or even mill sites. Because, as someone mentioned on the phone today, if you live within a mile of it, yeah, you get severely affected from their radiation. But some of the, uh, these people live hundreds of feet away from old mill sites or abandoned uranium mines. And so, yeah, these studies, there's a paucity of lack of health studies, but a lot of these people get uh, lung cancer or bone cancer, probably uh, uh, le le leukemia. But, you, but again, you have thyroid or cancer uh, kidney diseases, heart diseases, a lot of diabetes, autoimmune diseases, and I think there's just a lack of health studies to really emphasize to the public about how dangerous it is to live next to these abandoned uranium sites and old mill sites. But, you know, uh, the science is beginning to show that. It's just we need more health studies. Well, that's right, and certainly health studies that take into account the effects of internal exposure to radiation and the consumption of, of radioactive materials. Um, so our next question is from uh, Michelle Lee. Michelle, I'm going to unmute you now so you can ask your question. Michelle, are you still with us? Michelle? Uh, she might have submitted a written question as well. Um, so, it uh, looks like Michelle's written question is, uh, could the speakers provide NEARS with a list of the studies and reports with citations that the speakers identified in their presentations? Uh, then perhaps NEARS could put them up on our webpage um, and you know, the uh, link to the, to the recording of this presentation. Um, so certainly, NEARS would will be willing to put up 
uh, whatever reports and resources people have. And I, I you know, I, is, there, is there anything off the top of your head, uh, Patut, Charmaine, or or Clee that that um, that people should re be referred to? Yes, I would say uh, this is Patuch. Uh, the co the coalition that I'm involved with, which is uh, the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment, their website is MACE, M A S E Coalition, one word, MACEcoalition.org. Uh, that will refer you to probably other sites, uh, other links to other areas. But the other organization that's very engaged with us is the South Research, Southwest Research and Information Center, SRIC. Uh, uh, their public website is mase.sric.org. mase.sric.org is a very, very good site for information about the nuclear uh, energy. Yes, and I see that, that Susan Gordon is also chatting to us uh, links to the Southwest Uranium Impacts website as well, uh, as well as MACE's website. So thank you, Susan, for doing that. And we'll, we'll definitely include uh, the links to, uh, to Shrick's website and, and the other ones as well on, on the web page. Uh, Tim, this is Charmaine. Hi, Charmaine. Go ahead. Um, the one that I mentioned in the video, the um, Uranium Impacts in Lakota Territory, mm -hmm. that one is on our website, defendbykills.org. And then I have a couple of cancer studies in the one I mentioned in the video. If anybody wants that one, I forget how many pages it is, but I have it online. Um, and I always forget the name of it. SB is one of the names I remember. but. I could send that to them too if anybody wanted to email me at bhdefenders at msn.com. That's bh for Black Hills, bhdefenders at msn.com if they want a copy of that uh, cancer information. And I will send them all to you if you wish. Great. Yeah, please do. Please do. Um, so our next question is from Diane DeRigo. Uh, Diane, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now. Diane, are you with us? Hi, my microphone's not working, so I'm on Tim's. Uh, I wanted to know uh, specifically, and maybe this is in the studies, Charmaine, that you're going to forward to everyone, uh, you said that there are places where the radioactivity is higher in South Dakota than in Fukushima. Um, right. and I'm wondering what radionuclides or what, you know, what, what was compared? Is this gamma levels or you know, could you tell us a little more about that? Um, that was that was uh, Professor Kirfat. He brought out 14 students, a professor from the University of Michigan, a nuclear physics professor, and she works on nuclear health. And um, right off the top of my head, I can't remember. But they, we all had Geiger counters. I went with them, and then they went. They wanted to go into uh, the abandoned uranium mine right behind the Ludlow School that um, Klee showed in his presentation. And so they walked up into that mine, and as they were going down, they were taking readings. There was another professor with them from Oglala Lakota College, and they got about oh, partway down into the bottom, and it was getting so high on the readings that they they just came out. They came right back out, um, and that was one mine. Um, the, I remember when I first met her over 10 years ago that the one of the readings was 1,400 rims at the Riley Pass mine. That was down on the inside, and that was from a study that was done uh, by the Forest Service. I think I still have the information on that. It was on a big map, and she couldn't believe it. She said, this can't be true. It has to be a mistake. And I, I you know, what could I say? I was, this is the information I had from the Forest Service. Well, after they went into the Riley Pass, uh, this other mine, 
this other mine just a few miles away, then she said, no, I believe it now. I believe the, the information that's coming out from the couple of mines that have been studied. And that, that's up in the northwest corner of, of uh, South Dakota. I could, she, I could ask her also if she would send uh, the studies they did. Okay, great. Well, if you do, Charmaine, you know, we'd, be all, we'd also be happy to share that with, with everybody who attended today. Sure. Thank you. So, and the last question we have in the queue is from Candace Paul. Uh, Candace, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now so you can ask your question. Um, we seem to be having a problem getting to Candace's question. Uh, there might be another question in the written queue. Um, let's see. So Sally Gellert has a question uh, written to us. Uh, it says, is NEJAC, EPA's Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, being responsive? Environmental justice is supposed to be addressed by all federal agencies. How do we get them to be more active? Cumulative impact is so important, and the government seems to prefer to take each item individual, despite, individually despite the reality. Let me answer me... part of that. Uh, because EPA Region 6, you know, they have a, a program, the one that you're referencing, about how they're supposed to work with communities. Uh, and the challenge has always been for them to get out here. And also their focus, is, as defined, uh, environmental justice is generally people of color. Uh, but affected people are all, all ranges of the, of the economic Pichuch, are you still there? Uh, we're having trouble hearing you. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think it, uh, environmental justice is, is too narrow of a window. Be simply because it's environmental injustice to all affected people. And we're, we've always been pressuring the EPA to, to really assess the, this radioactive poisoning of everybody in very rural communities. And as has been mentioned, there's not enough, I suppose, emphasis upon the rural, uh, less densely populated communities because you don't, I suppose, have the numbers of people that are affected but yet we're all dying or, or all affected by this nuclear radiation poisoning. It needs to be more expanded, in other words. Sure. Okay, uh, Charmaine or Cleed, either of you want to want to respond to that? What was the question again? Uh, it was about, uh, you know, the EPA's stance on enforcing environmental justice requirements. Um, <laughs> Um, the only thing I would say was that when 10 years ago someone wrote to them and asked them when we were giving, you know, trying to wake people up to the abandoned uranium mines issue up here, and they called EPA and they wanted all the information that EPA had on abandoned uranium mines in South Dakota. And EPA sent them the newspaper columns that I had written, and that was all they had. So how are they going to do environmental justice when they don't even know the problem is here? Yet we keep on trying and trying and trying to get them to do something. The fact that we only have one, <laughs> one Superfund site, and that only came about because of a lawsuit down in the southwest. We have, of all the 272 in South Dakota alone, one Superfund site. So no, EPA, EPA as far as, we have, we're in Region 8, Region 8 EPA as far as I'm concerned. They don't even know what the word environmental justice is. That's astonishing. 
Um, well, I think we're coming up on 4.30 now, and uh, we don't have any more questions in the queue. Uh, I guess what I would do is, is you know, offer it to, uh, to our presenters if you've got any final comments that you'd like to make before, before we conclude. Uh, Clee, do you want to start off? Um, yeah, and I, I guess I could respond a little bit then to the NEJAC question in relation to its response. I, I um, as an organizer with this campaign, I've been mainly focused on the sort of strategic elements and whatnot. Um, but I work with a range of um, and support a range of campaigns in and around the Navajo Nation, working on uh, different resource extraction or resource colonialism issues uh, that we face. And as long as Mother Earth is viewed as a commodity, we recognize we're going to have these conflicts. There's fundamental, you know, uh, conflicts in the values that we have in relation to how we work with each other and our natural environment that, you know, we have teachings, traditional teachings as Diné people in relation to how we engage or not with these, you know, types of, of material resources such as uranium. And, you know, this is very dangerous for us. We've been plagued for many years. Um, in our communities and when we talk in the terms of environmental justice it's hard um, to 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 look at what the legacy has been for 60 years and look at what the response is to this day and how minimal you know how it seems to be that the EPA only feels that it's appropriate to do the minimal um, to address some of these issues and and we can compare it to the Gold King mine disaster where not only did the EPA wait days to inform uh, impacted communities downstream, but also sent out, um, you know, barrels uh, for water relief that were contaminated with residue from, from fracking fluids that these barrels had been previously used from, you know, as water for irrigation and livestock. And, um, you know, there's, there's a clear disconnect in, in what the term justice means then. And I know that um, Endalm, Eastern Navajo Diné against uranium mining have you know, been working for, for decades and, and, and people like Leona Morgan who, you know, are, are fierce um, advocates uh, and, and deeply committed uh, to, to ensuring social environmental justice on the terms of addressing the, environment, the, 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 the radioactive pollution legacies that are impacting our communities. And they have appealed, particularly Endam I know has appealed historically to um, NEJAC. Um, but, you know, the, the overall, you know, sort of precipitation uh, of, of, of this response that we've seen as a solution to address the issues on the terms of environmental justice in our communities is completely lackluster. Uh, it, it, is, it is, again, it's insufficient. Um, and so it's important, you know, when we look at the work that, you know, Deneno Nukes is doing or um, the range of other organizations in our communities directly, um, you know, it's important to, to, to look at it on those terms and to support them as well. So, you know, I just want to thank you all for um, allowing us the opportunity and, and look forward uh, to finding meaning ways to engage in the larger uh, anti-nuke movement um, to address uh, the, 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 the real sort of fallacy that um, is this push for uh, so-called clean nuclear energy, which is just a, a dirty and deadly lie. Thank you, Clee. Um, and uh, Charmaine, do you have any concluding thoughts you want to share? Um, when, when we started this campaign, Clean Up the Minds, and different ones in the group were doing research and found out there were 15,000 abandoned uranium mines in 15 western states. Although I always have to remember there is one abandoned uranium mine in Vermont. It just, it, 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 it appalled me. It blew me away. Um, when I first learned that there were 29 abandoned uranium mines in South Dakota, or I thought there was only 29, I was appalled. One abandoned uranium mine would be a disaster, yet let alone 15,000 plus. The people of the whole United States are being affected because the wind goes from the west to the east, from the north to the south. And so I'm, I'm really thankful to you, to Nears, to you, Tim, for trying to show people that nuclear is not just dirty, but it is deadly. And, and all the people are being affected 
These abandoned uranium mines are the beginning of the nuclear chain. Every time another nuclear power plant or nuclear weapon someplace is discharged, we're all affected. In, in my culture, we say we're all related. It's the end of a prayer, but it's also something that means we are all in this together. And so I'm very thankful to you for doing this webinar and giving us this chance to, to bring our voices from the beginning of the nuclear chain. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Charmaine. And, uh, and Patuch? Yeah. Uh, like Charmaine uh, emphasizes, and I, I too, that it impacts everybody nationally and globally. And the word, again, I, even though we may not believe it, but we are all becoming nuclear radiation victims as a result of man's disturbance of uranium. And until we uh, make it a, or understand that it, it's, a, it's a crisis involving all of humans, then uh, we're going to be beset with uses of nuclear energy. So I think we've got to learn more. Uh, we've got to do more of uh, what Mears is doing. And and I, I just want us to, to, to go down that path together in, a, in terms of a collaborative effort. And I'm glad that I, I saw, I guess, a news story about how uh, about 51% of Americans now believe that nuclear energy is dangerous. So we just got to enlarge that numbers of people. So thanks, Niers. And thank you, Patuch, and thank you again to to, to Clee and Charmaine for, for 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 presenting today. It's really just you know such an honor for for Nears to be able to um, you know to, to help get the word out, and uh, and you know and with tremendous respect for for, for 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 the work that you're doing in your communities, and um, and with every hope that that we can continue to you know to to work in uh, in solidarity and support, and. Uh, and I think with that, you know, we'll wrap up for today. Uh, this rec the recording of this webinar will be available on NIRS's website in a couple of days, uh, as well as uh, other materials uh, uh, that kind of go along with, with, you know, with the presentations today uh, that have been talked about. Um, this is, uh, you know, really the kickoff of our Nuclear is Dirty project, uh, really to, you know, to be able to, to start educating the public in a, in a, in a new and more expansive way about the dangers of the nuclear fuel chain. And I think kind of picking up on, on some of the themes of the last part of our discussion, um, you know, the climate justice movement is really, um, you know, making a lot of headway, um, you know, with uh, talking about the need to leave fossil fuels in the ground. And I think, you know, we, you know, we, we very much need to take the same approach to nuclear power that, uh, that you know, nuclear power derived, is derived from and predicated upon the extraction of uranium from the ground. And we've, uh, you know, we've, we've begun to, you know, to kind of sort of, you know, illustrate some of the tremendous impacts that that, that, that has had and that will have. Um, and not just, you know, to deal with in terms of going forward and, and leaving uranium in the ground from now on, we also clearly have a major legacy problem um, that is affecting communities on an ongoing basis that needs to be dealt with. Um, and so we really encourage folks, um, you know, to, to have that first and foremost in your minds when, you know, when, when, when the topics of nuclear power come up in your communities and in your states. Um, and so we, you know, we really hope that you'll continue to tune in to this series of events as we roll out the Nuclear is Dirty project. Uh, we'll have um, uh, some more resources uh, coming out next week uh, relating to environmental justice issues. And our next briefing is going to be on April 5th. Uh, on the um, on the, uh, the the impacts of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident, uh, which is where we'll be joined by Mary Olson from NIRS's staff, as well as Arnie Gundersons from Fairwinds Associates, uh, who were just in Japan for about a month um, doing presentations and meeting with people from affected areas in Japan and throughout the rest of the country, um, and talking, you know, with the, more of a focus on the on the on the environmental impacts of the accident and the struggles. Uh, that the people are having in Japan and will continue to have going forward um, as, as a result of, of the, the releases of environmental con of radi radioactive contaminants into the environment. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Hope you'll tune in on April 5th. And please uh, stay tuned uh, for, for, the, for the rest of the Nuclear is Dirty project. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend.